Morgan Bauer was born on April 13, 1996, in Memphis, Tennessee. She was the only child of Sherry Keenan and an unknown father. Morgan grew up in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and graduated from Central High School in 2014. She was a pretty girl with blue eyes and brown hair. Morgan had a passion for music and art and aspired to become a tattoo artist. She had a number of tattoos herself. One of those tattoos was a butterfly that symbolized her freedom and transformation. Her other tattoos were a sun moon near her right shoulder inside a Celtic design, an anchor with the words, whatever you love can be taken away, so live like it's your last day, on her left wrist, a blue and orange jellyfish on her arm from her inner wrist to elbow, and a black tree and flowers on the back of her neck. She also had her ears gauged and her lip pierced twice. Morgan was an avid reader and writer, enjoying books from all different genres. She also wrote poems and stories on her blog. Morgan was a talented dancer and performer and had been dancing since she was three years old. She participated in various competitions and shows. She started dating Jose Rodriguez when she turned 18. The two of them met online. Morgan also had a dream of becoming a journalist or photographer. She always carried her camera with her. Morgan was active on different social media platforms. She posted photos of herself and her friends, as well as inspirational quotes and memes, especially on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. She had thousands of followers who admired her beauty and personality. Morgan loved to travel and explore new places. She had visited 13 states in the U.S. and had plans to visit more. She decided to leave the small town of Aberdeen in South Dakota and moved to Atlanta, Georgia, in search of a new, independent life. She left on February 12, 2016. Morgan had a pet cat named Luna, whom she adored. She adopted Luna from a shelter and left the cat with her mother when she moved. Morgan had $20 to her name and was expecting a tax refund. She stayed with a man she had met on Craigslist for the first night in Atlanta. Their arrangement included that Morgan clean the house until she managed to find a job. Unfortunately, this agreement did not work out between the two roommates. She then stayed at different hotels. Morgan took a job as a dancer in a Gainesville, Georgia club called The Top of Gainesville. She and her mother were in contact every day or every other day through social media or phone calls. Morgan also remained in contact with friends until February 25, 2016. It was then that she abruptly went silent. On that specific evening, she was dancing at Top of Gainesville. Afterwards, Morgan, Morgan's co-worker, and her co-worker's boyfriend all left the club together. They dropped Morgan off at the Sitco gas station in Covington, where she got into a green eclipse with an unknown driver. That would be the last time Morgan was seen alive. Her mom, Sherry Keenan, became concerned when she could not reach Morgan. She decided to go to Atlanta to find Morgan. Sherry went to the last motel that Morgan was staying in. There, she found that all of Morgan's luggage was still in place. This indicated to her that Morgan did not run away. Sherry then talked to Morgan's boyfriend, Jose Rodriguez, to hear if he knew anything about where she could possibly be. Jose told her that he loved Morgan and was worried about her safety as well. He also said that he had not seen her or heard from her. On March 8, 2016, after not hearing from Morgan for over a week, Sherry Keenan reported her daughter as missing to the Atlanta Police Department. 
According to her cell phone records, officers determined that Morgan's last phone call was made to Jose on February 25, 2016. In Morgan's last Instagram video, she was seen walking in the Yellow River Park in Newton County, Georgia. An unidentified man could be seen walking behind her. Morgan's Instagram was private, but Sherry Keenan said a friend of her daughter's sent her a screenshot of Morgan's last post. It showed that it was posted on February 26, 2016, a day after she was seen climbing into the Green Eclipse. That meant police were looking in the wrong places, based on an incorrect timeline. Investigators tried to identify the man in the video to gather information, but they were unable to do so. Multiple law enforcement agencies got involved in the attempt to locate Morgan. Family members spoke to news outlets to share more information about the missing teen. Her disappearance sparked a massive online search due to the huge following she had. She had moved to the Atlanta area only about two weeks before she went missing, leaving nothing but unanswered questions in her absence. Despite investigators' best efforts, they were unable to locate Morgan. They did not know if she left willingly or if foul play was involved. Sherry Keenan said in 2019, There is not a lot of information out there. Morgan is a cold case but an active cold case with the Atlanta Police Department. Family and friends held a vigil on February 25, 2023, where they remembered the young woman who went missing when she was only 19 years old. Sherry Keenan said, I am not ready to say goodbye until she is found. She organized the Saturday vigil at the Yellow River Park in Newton County, this was the same park as the one where Morgan was last seen. The next update on the case came on July 27, 2023. It was then that police said they had new information, which they could not make public. The information had prompted investigators to go back and review the case from the beginning. It then led to a search warrant for a property on 2 South Broad Street in Atlanta. Based on the new information, it was suspected that Morgan's remains might be buried there. Police reported that the current owner of the house cooperated with the investigation and was not considered a suspect. The location of 2 South Broad Street is about a 10-minute walk from the park where Morgan was last seen. Authorities searched both the home and the large area of open property the Porterdale Police Department, in conjunction with the FBI and the Atlanta Police Department, conducted a one-day search on July 27th to retrieve evidence related to the missing person case. There were several tents set up in a wooded area near the large home. Police released videos of FBI agents slowly combing the property in grid formation. Police said after the search that they believe Morgan's life was taken and her body was dumped. Police did not specify what they found that led to this conclusion, since they did not find Morgan's body. Sergeant Michael Walden gave feedback and said that their search led to the location of items of evidentiary interest. However, they could not reveal additional information. Morgan's mom, Sherry, had this to say during the search. I believe Morgan, if she was still here, she would have reached out. Even if she did not want to talk to me, she would have reached out to her grandma. She added that the last time she saw her baby girl, she gave her something to keep her safe. We did not really talk. I gave her a penny, though. I told her to put the penny in her pocket and to keep it with her to keep her safe. She was with a friend, but I do not know who he was. They walked off, and that was the last time I ever saw her. Sherry referred to an unknown man that was with Morgan before she left for Atlanta. 
Sherry suspected the new information and the search of the property would unveil something big in her daughter's case. Casey McClure, who runs an organization that provides outreach to exploited women and has helped in the search since it began, said, it all goes back to the couple that was last seen with Morgan. McClure also said that the investigators have spoken directly to the couple, acting on a tip. They were identified by officers and were publicly referred to by their last names, Goebel and Warren. McClure said Goebel was very sweet and polite and well-mannered and seemed concerned about Morgan. Warren was very rigid. On Saturday, August 5, 2023, the City of Porterdale Police Department posted the following on Facebook. Porterdale police officers obtained arrest warrants and two persons have been arrested in this ongoing investigation. Investigators are still actively working on this case and it is continuing to develop while they are in constant communication with our district attorney and his office. Police Chief Jason Cripps said in the arrest announcement that he was grateful for the help of the other agencies. This was finally a new update in the over seven-year disappearance of Morgan. 27-year-old Jonathan Alexander Warren was arrested in Los Angeles in connection to Morgan's case. He was charged with four felonies, taking Morgan's life, hiding that fact, aggravated assault, and tampering with evidence. In accordance with California law, Warren's mugshot was not released. He apparently lived in the area where Morgan was last seen at the time that she disappeared. Warren has a long list of previous offenses. He has charges of fleeing or attempting to elude, driving without headlights in the dark, driving while license is suspended or revoked, and reckless driving. He was 22 years old when he committed these crimes. Most importantly, his address was listed as 2 South Broad Street, Porterdale. This is the same address where the latest search for evidence was done. 27-year-old Caitlin Goebel was arrested in Peoria, Illinois, also in connection to Morgan's case. She was charged with two felonies, concealing the fact that she assisted in taking Morgan's life, as well as tampering with evidence. She is currently being held in Peoria County Jail. Her mugshot was also not released. The nature of the relationship between Morgan and the couple was not confirmed by police. Newton County District Attorney Randy McGinley said his office is hopeful that Morgan's family will soon see justice. I always look at it from the victim's perspective, or in this case, the victim's family. This family has been waiting for years, not knowing what has happened. He also said that right now they were still waiting on Warren and Goebel to be extradited back to Newton County so they can begin to review the case files. We do not usually have the entire case file until the arrest is made, so we need time to review the case file, McKinley added. On Monday, August 7, 2023, Morgan's mother was not ready to speak on camera about the news of the arrests, but instead posted an update on the massive Missing Morgan Facebook page. Sherry Keenan described Morgan as charismatic, gentle-hearted, beautiful, and funny. She also said that Morgan was her best friend and that she missed her terribly. What we cannot share is speculation, she wrote. Please understand... Legally and currently, Morgan is still considered a missing person. While we are so grateful that arrests have been made, this is an ongoing investigation. Haxton Gilbert, a friend of Morgan, had this to say after the arrests. It is a big shock. They were the last two people to be seen with my friend Morgan. I just want to know what happened, you know. They told investigators. They even told her mom. They dropped her off at a gas station. And that is the last they saw of her. 
The new information that investigators received was an informant that said investigators should take a new look at Warren and Goebel. The evidentiary items found at the couple's home confirmed to investigators that they were responsible for taking Morgan's life. The hope is that the couple will admit to what they did and tell investigators where Morgan's body can be found so that Morgan's family and friends can start the healing process. Eileen Cotter was born in 1952, three years after her parents moved from Ireland to England. Her father, Patrick Cotter, was a laborer. In 1967, 15-year-old Eileen found the body of her mother, who sadly took her own life. Eileen left school at 16 and worked at a holiday camp in Barry Island in Wales. Later on, she found work at a care home in Ireland. Just after 2 p.m. on June 1, 1974, a resident at a block of apartments in Hamilton Park, Highbury, North London, saw what she thought was a bundle of rags in the courtyard next to a block of garages. Another resident realized it was a body and asked her father to call the police. When police arrived at the scene, they documented that the female body was lifeless. The body was identified as Eileen Cotter's. She was 22 years old at the time. Eileen was found strangled, with her one eye black and bruises on her face and neck. She was lying face down with her lower body exposed and her underwear and tights pulled down. Her handbag, glasses, and shoes were missing. Eileen Connor's father released a statement detailing his daughter's short life marred by family tragedies after her body was found. A forensic examination was done on her body. A pathologist found that the cause was manual strangulation. DNA samples were recovered from two places on Eileen's body. The DNA was used to extract DNA profiles, but unfortunately, no matches could be made at the time. Police interviewed 92 potential suspects and carried out an extensive operation to identify local curb crawlers in their effort to find the attacker. Unfortunately, he was not identified, and her case went unsolved. In 2012, 37 years after Eileen's body was found, the investigation was reopened following advances in DNA profiling. The trail went cold for seven more years, until 2019, when John Applegren came to the attention of police for attacking his wife, Anne Smythe Applegren. He lived in the same area as Eileen when the crime was committed. John Applegren is an 80-year-old pensioner who was formerly a minicab driver and a bricklayer. He is from South Africa and had previously been married in South Africa to a woman with whom he had two children. It is not clear if Anne Smythe Applegren is his second or third wife, as there are no details of a second wife, although many sources call Anne his third wife. It was in February 2019 that he was arrested for domestic assault by his then-wife, Anne Applegren. There was a breakthrough when police took Applegren's DNA for the first time. The sample was a billion to one probability of a match to the DNA collected from Eileen Cotter's body. When interviewed, he claimed that he did not know Eileen, but accepted he had relations with other women during his marriage. On June 22, 2022, John Applegren was arrested and charged with the slaying of Eileen Cotter. The arrest was made after investigators concluded that Applegren is 100% responsible for what happened to Eileen. Detective Chief Inspector Lawrence Smith said that if someone knocked on his door and arrested him for a crime of almost 50 years ago, 
he would repeatedly plead his innocence until he could no longer speak. That was not him. He was very calm about it. He had an aura of, dare I say, evilness about him. Applegren appeared at the Bromley Magistrates Court on Thursday, June 23, 2022, where he was remanded into custody. The judge fixed a trial of up to four weeks from June 6, 2023. Opening the prosecution's case, Prosecutor Alexandra Healy said that DNA samples taken from Eileen's body in 1975 matched those of John Applegren of Bryden Close in Sydenham, southeast London. During the trial, she told jurors that in 2019, Applegren had come to the attention of police for attacking his wife. The court heard Applegren was seen on the night of the slaying in 1975 at a Finsbury Park hot dog stall where Eileen would often go. Miss Healy also told the jury that it appeared Eileen had been pushed out of a car after she and Applegren had intercourse. She described to the court, her body was discovered in the position it fell, without shoes and with her tights and underwear still around her right leg. Applegren hit Eileen in the face and throttled her before throwing her body out of his car. The defendant was 31 at the time. This happened just six weeks after the birth of his first child with his then-wife, Anne. Applegren told police in 1975, when he was interviewed as a potential suspect, that he was living in Leighton and never went to the Finsbury Park and Highbury area which was a lie. Miss Healy also said, Eileen did not have the defendant's DNA on her underwear and tights because she never pulled them up after they were together. She never pulled them up because she was not alive anymore. During the court case, it was revealed that Eileen and Anne were most definitely not Applegren's only victims. Applegren assaulted an 18-year-old female guest at his own wedding to Anne Applegren on October 14, 1972. Ms. Healy told jurors the incident only came to light years later when police interviewed Anne Applegren as part of the reinvestigation into Eileen's case in 2012. Ms. Healy told jurors that Applegren had pushed the 18-year-old woman against a wall after she left the toilet at his wedding reception and assaulted her. The victim had not told anyone about the incident, as she was afraid she would be blamed. The teenager told Anne Applegren about the assault after the pair later divorced. Anne Applegren, mother of two, also revealed that she had been mistreated and that Applegren had once grabbed her neck with both hands. She added that she believed he was cheating on her just months after their 1972 marriage and later found out he was sleeping with her brother's wife. After 11 hours of jury deliberation, Mrs. Justice May announced the jury's final decision. She told Applegren that putting your hands around a young woman's neck and squeezing hard carried a high risk which ought to have been obvious. The judge added, Eileen must have been terrified. The jury found Applegren guilty on Friday, June 16, 2023, following a two-week trial. In addition to being found guilty of manslaughter, he was also convicted of indecent assault. Justice May then sentenced Applegren to 10 years for manslaughter and a further six months for the earlier assault to run consecutively. This means he will be eligible for release on parole after five years and three months on June 21, 2028, when he is 85 and hopefully worm food. In mitigation, Justin Rouse listed Applegren's health problems, saying the defendant would be affected significantly by serving his sentence. Detective Chief Inspector Lawrence Smith said, Eileen's life was tragically ended at a young age, with her body then discarded onto the street. When my team reviewed the original investigation, 
we were impressed by how thorough it was. Investigators at the time used every available method to find the suspect, including operations with decoy women. This was a tactic used at the time where female police officers under protection were placed at the scenes of crimes in efforts to draw out predatory men. Smith continued, Unfortunately, they did not have the science available to us now, and although he should have been in prison decades ago, he has now been brought to justice. Investigating violence against women and girls is a priority for the Metropolitan Police, and we will relentlessly pursue predatory men, whether a crime took place decades ago or today. Eileen's half-brother, Patrick Cotter, who was five at the time of her demise, said in a statement, Eileen and I shared the same father. My mother cared for Eileen as her own mother passed away. I was not only deprived of a sister I had little time to get to know, the knock-on effect also meant I lost my mother, who took her own life, and my father to mental illness and alcoholism. This was all brought about because John Applegren took Eileen's life. Three years after Eileen's strangling, my mother took her own life, as the relationship between her and my father broke down significantly. Due to the fighting between them, I was placed in a care home where I suffered abuse until the age of about 11. It was never explained to me why I was placed in care, and I lived most of my childhood believing it is because of something I had done wrong. His statement continues, Again, being a young child, I struggled to understand with little explanation given to me. My father drank heavily, but Eileen's demise and the loss of my mother caused him to drink even more, and he was eventually admitted to Springfield Psychiatric Hospital. Following this, my father went to live with his brother in Ireland. However, his drinking became too much, and he also passed away. According to Patrick Cotter Jr., he has no memory of Eileen's funeral and has no idea whether she was buried or cremated. He also has no idea where she was laid to rest. As a result, he had never been able to visit her grave. Patrick continued, I spent a very unhappy childhood moving amongst various care homes and foster homes. However, when I was 14 years old, I was placed with my foster parents, John and Yvonne. I was very fortunate to be placed in a loving, caring home. They explained various aspects of my life that I did not know or understand, filling in the gaps, so to speak. I also had a half-brother from my mother, who was 17 years older than me. However, when I was taken into care, he was told to avoid any contact with me. I felt as though I lost him as well. He was someone I was very fond of and have happy memories of, but this was also taken from me. Patrick Cotter concluded, I would like to see justice for Eileen, whose life was cruelly cut short 49 years ago. As a result of the traumatic event during my childhood, I shut down emotionally. It has made it difficult for me to form close relationships. I only have very faint memories of my sister, but I believe she cared for me. Thank you.